Dune is difficult to describe in simple terms. Sure, it's sci-fi, sort of, but there are no computers, and the fact that it's taking place in a distant future is often entirely irrelevant. Or maybe you could call it a hero's journey, a coming-of-age epic. Except most of the characters are born with the mind of an adult in their child body, so there's not really any age to come of, and the hero whose journey we're following does some very unheroic things. So then, would it be fair to call Dune a villain origin story? A subversion of the hero's journey trope in which we see the 15-year-old Superman become a homicidal overlord? Well, as is often the case with Frank Herbert's Dune, it's not quite that simple. One of the most beautiful things that Dune does is that it calls into question the hero-villain dichotomy as a whole. It makes us question the very tropes and formats of storytelling as it uses them. Today, I want to deconstruct the character of Paul Atreides and his son, Leto II, in order to figure out whether they are the heroes or the villains of their story. In this video, I will be covering information from the first four Dune books, so that's up through God Emperor, so if you're very spoiler avoidant, you might want to click away and join us back next week. As always though, Dune is still enjoyable even with spoilers because it kind of spoils itself, and if you haven't read the books and you still want to watch, I will hopefully be giving enough context that you'll be able to understand it, even if you have not read all four of those books. At a surface level, the first Dune novel could very easily be mistaken as the tale of a hero. You could even argue that that was the very reason it got published in the first place. The editor for the astounding science fiction magazine, John W. Campbell, was obsessed with the idea of supermen, of brave, individualistic, most importantly male, heroes. And when he read the first couple chapters of Dune, he was pretty convinced that Paul Atreides fit that bill perfectly. He even wrote to Herbert saying, congratulations, you are now the father of a 15-year-old Superman. And to be honest, I can't really fault Campbell for coming to that conclusion. Paul starts out this intrepid young man, trained to perfection of mind and body by his powerful parents, plagued by visions of a far-off land and an oppressed people. He's even backed up by a prophecy that clearly indicates that he is the Chosen One. The story even plays out exactly as you think it would. He's cast out into the wilderness, he joins the native people and learns their ways, and then he uses his superior skills and might and intelligence to lead them to freedom. It's a story that we've seen play out again and again, from The Lord of the Rings to Blue People Avatar to Lawrence of Arabia. It plays in so perfectly to these traditional tropes, it follows exactly along the steps we've seen play out a dozen times, so it's not hard to extrapolate where the story is going to go and what it's trying to say. Campbell certainly extrapolated that that was where the story was going to go, which is why he published Herbert's Dune on the pages of his astounding magazine. We saw the same thing occur when the uninitiated walked out of the first Denis Villeneuve Dune movie. We've been primed to expect a certain story, and we see the clues laid out, and obviously we're gonna cheer for our hero. Of course, by the end of the first Dune novel, or by the end of the second movie, most people have clued into the fact that there is something else going on. Rather than adopting this new powerful station with gusto, Paul seems afraid, but not afraid of his enemies or afraid that he won't be noble enough to handle the power like we see in most of these Hero's Journey stories. Paul seems afraid of himself. There's one line in the second Dune movie that I think encompasses this perfectly, and it's as Paul is talking to Gurney Halleck about the horrors that might occur if his visions come true. Billions of corpses scattered across the galaxy, all dying because of me. Because you lose control. Because I gain it. Needless to say, Paul is struggling to hold on to who he actually is as this wave of power is being thrust upon him. He's having a full-on identity crisis. Actually, speaking of identity, if you're interested in protecting yours and keeping yourself safe online, you should check out this video's sponsor, Incogni. 
Every year, data brokers are becoming more of a problem. Data brokers make their money by selling your personal information, like your name, your social security number, your address, and much more. Just by googling your name, you can see just how much of your information is available for any unsavory people to use. Luckily, you can combat this with Incogni. Incogni will reach out to data brokers for you and request that your personal data be removed. It could take you years to do this yourself, but Incogni takes care of the hassle and makes sure that you feel safe online. If you want to prioritize your online security, you can give Incogni a try. If you use my code right here at the link in my description, you can get yourself 60% off an annual plan. Thank you so much to Incogni for sponsoring this video, and thanks to all of you for checking out my sponsors when I have them. The problem is that Paul is ticking all the boxes of the hero's journey, but he's not a hero. The prophecy that claimed him to be the chosen one is just Bene Gesserit propaganda. His acceptance by the Fremen was only made possible due to their intense desire and need for a messiah and his subtle manipulation of those fears. He doesn't have superpowers, he's just the result of centuries of inbreeding and a lot of space drugs. Paul's not leading the Fremen to freedom or justice, he is heralding in a genocide. So, if Paul isn't the hero, and the story is intended to be a subversion of these hero's journey tropes, does that make him a villain? And I'll admit, there's a lot of evidence that says he might be. At least Frank Herbert made absolutely sure that no one was going to make the mistake of calling Paul a good guy. After the publication of the first Dune novel, Frank Herbert really seemed to be struggling with how many people viewed Paul completely uncritically as a really great guy, as a 15-year-old Superman. It was in part because of this that he decided to continue the story into Dune Messiah. The events described in Messiah are probably the best evidence that anybody has that Paul is irredeemably villainous. It opens 12 years after the events of the first novel, and in that time, the Holy War has swept across the universe with Paul at the helm. Paul is probably the one who is most aware of how messed up all of this is, and he ends up comparing himself to some of Old Earth's most evil warmongers. He brings up the atrocities committed in the Second World War, observing, He killed more than six million. Pretty good for those days. Killed by his legions? Stilgar asked. Yes. Not very impressive statistics, my lord. Very good still. Statistics, at a conservative estimate, I've killed 61 billion, sterilized 90 planets, completely demoralized 500 others. Will be a hundred generations recovering from Muad'Dib's jihad. I find it hard to imagine that anyone will ever surpass this. A barking laugh erupted from his throat. Although Harkonnen oppression may have been cruel and the hand of the Imperium harsh, they are nothing compared to the blood-soaked fists of Paul Atreides. From sheer death toll alone, he is one of, if not the worst tyrant that the world has ever seen. For many people, he has now ascended above even the hero status and is now worshipped as a god. An entire religious structure has sprung up around Paul and his sister and his mother and the planet itself, enforced by fearsome Fremen soldiers. To speak out against Muad'Dib is now a sin, punishable by death. Paul isn't just a cruel leader, he has become a vengeful god. And yet, the insight lent to us by the books, by the fact that we are seeing such an intimate part of Paul's mind, reveals to us that for Paul, this victory is incredibly bitter. At the end of Dune, for all intents and purposes, Paul is as powerful as he could possibly get. He's on the top, he's the emperor, he has the puppet strings of the entire Imperium at his fingertips. And yet somehow he is more powerless than ever. He realizes that by taking on this power, he has become the fulcrum point around which the rest of the universe is pivoting. Although the rest of the universe is worrying about him, he remains inert, 
stationary, with all of the powers of time and space ripping unstoppably through him. He remained silent, thinking like the seed he was, thinking with the race consciousness he had first experienced as terrible purpose. He found that he could no longer hate the Bene Gesserit, or the Emperor, or even the Harkonnens. They were all caught up in the need of their race to renew its scattered inheritance, to cross and mingle and infuse their bloodlines in a great new pooling of genes. And the race knew of only one sure way for this. The ancient way. The tried and certain way that rolled over everything in its path. Jihad. Despite his cruel and perhaps even irredeemable actions, I think that it would be wrong to call Paul Atreides a willing participant in these horrors. At first, he just played along, hoping that as the Kwisat Haderach, as the Lisan al-Gaib, he would be able to use his power to stop the coming holy war. By the time he realized this was impossible, there was no way that he could have extracted himself. Dead or alive, Paul was now their hero, their rallying point, their messiah. By then, he was little more than the banner being waved over the cruel machinations of the universe. In almost every other story, Paul's rise to power and his success would have been seen as a victory. But Herbert saw things a bit more cynically. This was one of my themes for Dune. Don't give over all of your critical faculties to people in power, no matter how admirable those people may appear to be. Beneath the hero's facade, you will find a human being who makes human mistakes. Enormous problems arise when human mistakes are made on the grand scale available to a superhero. And yet Dune proves that this system of elevating unworthy men to godhood it may be unavoidable. It is a self-perpetuating system. It tells us that there is this vacuum at the center of our society, and if it is left empty for too long, then a regular human being will be sucked in, warped beyond recognition, beyond humanity, by the greater forces of the cosmos. The story of Dune Messiah is the tragic tale of Paul Atreides striving to remain human at the eye of that cosmic storm. Some people want to make him out to be a hero, to be a god. Other people want to call him a villain. But Paul, lonely and alone at the fulcrum of the universe, ends up being a victim. And I'll admit that calling Paul a victim is kind of a tough pill to swallow. It's almost an indefensible position. He has the blood of literally billions of people on his hands. He has destroyed entire planets. Armed by charisma and manipulation, he has twisted the minds of a native population to make them his pawns and destroyed their traditional way of life in the process. And yet, the books allow us to see just how much of a sacrifice that was. Paul saw that there was only one way forward, only one way that humanity could survive, and he put himself down on that altar to be sacrificed. All of this always makes me think about the traitor Yue. Wellington Yue was put into a nearly impossible situation. He could save his wife, but in order to do that, he would have to betray the family that employed him. He knew from the very beginning that choosing his wife and betraying the Atreides family would mark him out for the rest of history as a traitor, as a villain, but he bit that bullet anyway. He was almost faced with the trolley problem. You know, he comes to a fork in the trolley tracks, and on one side is his poor, dear, tortured wife, and on the other side is the Atreides family. He can pull a lever to switch from one track to the other, so does he pull the lever or not? And as if that choice wasn't hard enough to make already, I'm sure that Yue knew that if he didn't take this offer, if he didn't betray the Atreides, somebody else would. The Harkonnens, with their plans within plans, certainly would have found somebody else, and the Atreides would have died, and then Yue and his wife also would have died. He was put between a rock and a hard place to the nth degree, and it's honestly quite justifiable that he made the decisions that he made. 
I'd almost call it brave. This is a smaller version of the choice that Paul was faced with. Does he choose to save his humanity or the entire human race? I honestly think that none of us can truthfully say what we would choose in that situation. Just like the traditional trolley problem, there is no right answer. And the worst part is that just like you, eh, if Paul fails, somebody else is going to have to take his place. But to me, the most telling part of Paul's story is the end. Although he sacrifices and loses so much, and is probably just about this close to having that trolley run him down completely, ultimately, he fails. At the end of Dune Messiah, after the tragic loss of Chani, Paul finds himself fracturing under the pressure. He explains to Duncan, There are some things no one can bear. I meddled in all the possible futures I could create until finally, they created me. My lord, you shouldn't. There are problems in this universe for which there are no answers, Paul said. Nothing, nothing can be done. As he spoke, Paul felt his link with the vision shatter. His mind cowered, overwhelmed by infinite possibilities. His lost vision became like the wind, blowing where it willed. In the end, Paul revealed himself to be neither hero nor villain. He was human, so human that he could not sacrifice himself and the people he loved for the good of the many. Because of this, he is stripped of his godhood, his heroism, or his villainy, and he wanders into the desert, alone and blind. The consequences of this failure are unavoidable and devastating. With the version of Paul that everyone knew gone, with his connection to the future completely severed, his children were left struggling to dismantle the mythos of Paul's godhood. Even Paul, who returns from the desert a completely transformed man, tries to tear down his legacy. He preaches, Paul Atreides is no more. He tried to stand as a supreme moral symbol while he renounced all moral pretensions. He became a saint without a god. Every word a blasphemy. His inability to commit, in the end, made the entire empire that he had built pointless. All the slaughter was aimless, the loss of the Fremen lifestyle was for no reason. But it didn't have to be that way. As I said, now that Paul had failed, the responsibility for that fell onto the next generation. His son, Leto II, is presented with the same trolley problem. He can choose between his own humanity and the survival of the human race. And he knows that there's only one real choice he can make. He understands why his father made the decision that he made. He understands his fear, but he knows better. Leto felt the dissonance between them then. It was an element of the universe with which his entire life grappled. Either he or his father would be forced to act soon, making a decision by that act, choosing a vision. And his father was right. Trying for some ultimate control of the universe, you only built weapons with which the universe eventually defeated you. To choose and manage a vision required you to balance on a single thin thread, playing God on a high tight wire with cosmic solitude on both sides. Each of them had only a desperate and lonely courage upon which to rely, but Leto possessed two advantages. He had committed himself upon a path from which there was no turning back, and he had accepted the terrible consequences to himself. His father still hoped there was a way back and had made no final commitment. Leto knows there's no going back. There is no failing the golden path this time. He allows himself to be taken over by larval sandworms and the spice inundates his body. He gains prescient knowledge over every future, unlimited power, and near immortality. And the only cost is his humanity. Leto needs to do this so that he can become the all-powerful God Emperor. And this curse that he has placed upon himself, this life that he has doomed himself to, is really just a magnified version of what Paul suffered. By some, he's seen as a god, and he's worshipped, 
and others see him as a tyrant, as the worst tyrant that ever has been and ever will be. But this is the golden path. Danima said, He'll lead humans through the cult of death into the free air of exuberant life. He speaks of death because that's necessary still. It's a tension by which the living know they're alive. When his empire falls, oh yes, it'll fall. You think this is Kralizek now, but Kralizek is yet to come. And when it comes, humans will have renewed their memory of what it's like to be alive. The memory will persist as long as there's a single human living. We'll go through the crucible once more still, and we'll come out of it. We always arise from our own ashes. Always. Faradin, hearing her words, understood now what she'd meant in telling him about Leto running. He'll not be human. In order to survive the coming years, humanity needed to go through a crucible. They needed to be faced with Kralazek, with the end times, because only then could they start anew, repopulating the universe with a new race of people who were immune to the trap of prescience. They needed an enemy to unify against, to rally against. They needed a dark age to look back on when they had created their new society, and in order to give that to them, Leto could not be human. This is probably the hardest choice a person could make. Leto outlives every person that he loves. He is despised by most people and remotely worshipped by the others. His body is twisted and warped as he becomes a bloated worm man, repulsive to look at. The isolation, the boredom that Paul experienced as Muad'Dib is magnified tenfold by the tragedy of the God Emperor of Dune. I cannot walk among my fellows without their special notice. I am no longer one of you. I am alone. Love. Many people love me, but my shape keeps us apart. We are separated, Siona, by a gulf that no other human dares to bridge. Ultimate hero or ultimate villain, it doesn't really matter. Leto had to make himself monstrous in order to save humanity, meaning that somehow he is both at once. Herbert wasn't railing against heroes or even villains. He was attacking the very notion that human beings could be either. The best way that I've found to visualize it is as a spectrum, and I will put in a handy dandy little graphic here. The traditional understanding is that on one side we have heroes, and on the other side we have villains. And in the middle here, it's just, you know, humans. But in Dune, Herbert is showing us that these two ends of the spectrum might be a little closer than you think. Instead, it actually ends up being more of a circle. The more purely heroic or villainous that somebody becomes, the less human they become. Paul, and especially Leto, hurtled so far down to these extremities that it becomes almost impossible to parse out whether they are heroes or villains. Instead, they just end up inhuman. The problem is not good people versus bad people. The problem is trying to force real human beings into either of those boxes, trying to file off their rough edges or force them to expand to fill a space that's too large for them. Leda II calls this practice, this system, a mystique. There's always a prevailing mystique in any civilization, Leto said. It builds itself as a barrier against change, and that always leaves future generations unprepared for the universe's treachery. All mystiques are the same in building these barriers. The religious mystique, the hero-leader mystique, the messiah mystique, the mystique of science technology, and the mystique of nature itself. We live in an Imperium which such a mystique has shaped, and now that Imperium is falling apart because most people don't distinguish between mystique and the universe. You see, the mystique is like demon possession. It tends to take over the consciousness, becoming all things to the observer. I like to recontextualize this idea of the mystique as the more familiar term of story. 
Stories are great. They are a convenient and beautiful way to explore the most essential parts of who we are. But they're not real. The moment that we start to confuse narratives and reality, the moment that we start to turn real people into characters, we lose the grip on what is possible, what is good, what is healthy. No person is strictly a hero or entirely a villain. And by trying to make them either, we strip them of the beautiful ambiguity of being human. Any one person that, like Leto, can answer the trolley problem objectively, they stop being human. We are inherently over-worrying, indecisive, selfish. We want to be good, and it is okay to strive to be a hero, but the moment that we achieve that perfection, the moment that we become God, we're lost. Whether or not Paul Atreides or Leto II count as villains is irrelevant. What we can truly learn from them is that we need to stop trying to fit wonderfully complex human beings into the oversimplistic, too small boxes of story. We are neither one nor the other, and that is where the true beauty lies. Now, all of that being said, you probably could make an argument one way or another, especially saying that they're villains. So please let me know in the comments whether you think they're heroes or villains or neither. Now, this video is not sponsored by HBO Max, but this is your reminder that Dune 2 is now streaming on there. So if you didn't get the chance to see that one in theaters, you should go watch it and come back here and tell me what you thought because I like that movie very, very much and I want to talk about it all the time to my housemate's annoyance. Give this video a like if you enjoyed it or you learned something, and if you like the kind of stuff I make here, maybe consider checking out my Patreon. We have a ton of fun on my patrons' Discord on there, and a lot of the times you'll get sneak peeks for the videos that I have coming up just because that's a great place for me to talk about stuff, so uh, go ahead and check that out. The link is in the description. Anyway, thank you so much for hanging out with me today, and if you want to come back next week, go ahead and subscribe. Thanks so much for watching, and I hope that you have a very happy hobbity. Day.